Hello again, everyone, um, and welcome to this second session of the webinar series, Warm Up to UNEA 5.2, towards the decision to launch negotiations on a new global agreement on plastic pollution. My name is uh, Magnus Löwel. I'm associated with the Norwegian Academy of International Law, NAIL. I'm joining you today from uh, Geneva, Switzerland. I will have the pleasure of taking you through today's uh, event, and I hope, therefore, that you can hear me all right. This series of webinars will be running until the 15th of February uh, next year in 2022. More information about this whole series is available on the website marinelitterhub.com. I would appreciate if colleagues um, maybe in, in Grid Arndal could post a link to this website in the chat box if that's uh, um, uh, indeed a, a possibility. With these online events, we, we aim to create an informal um, virtual meeting place and also an opportunity to prepare for the discussions on plastic pollution that will take place in the run-up to and during UNEA 5.2 in February 2022. We are currently at an extremely interesting moment in history when it comes to international plastics uh, governance. And through these events, we hope to address several issues of, of relevance and notably, of course, for the draft resolution um, on plastic pollution to be considered for adoption uh, at UNEA 5.2. Last week, um, many of you attended uh, our discussion on the scope and goals of a new global plastics agreement. The recording of that event is, as I understand it, available now on marinelitterhub.com. In the new year, on the 17th of January, uh, we will have a webinar on the role of the United Nations in efforts to combat marine plastic pollution. Ten days after that, on the 27th of January, we'll organize a uh, discussion on the relevance of sustainability criteria for such an agreement. Um, the month after, on the 3rd of February, there will be a discussion about potential financial mechanisms in a new uh, agreement. And finally, on the 15th of February, we'll have an event uh, with the enticing working title, Recycling Myths and Life Cycle, uh, cycle Measures. And an overview of all these events uh, and then a recording of them after they've been held can be found on marinelitterhub.com. In today's uh, event, we will, um, as you all know, uh, look into the topic of national action plans or national plastic management plans, uh, which many uh, expect and, and some indeed hope will be a central feature of a new global agreement on plastic uh, pollution. Yet many countries and regions already have uh, national plastic action plans in place. So what are the experiences and lessons learned for these national and regional efforts for a new global agreement? This is the question, the central question, that we will try to get some answers to today. A few words on housekeeping before we begin. This webinar, um, as mentioned initially, is being recorded um, and the recording will be uh, made available. Um, in addition to past webinars, you can also find all of the Nordic reports on a new global agreement and other useful resources on marinelitterhub.com. To, to prepare for UNEA 5.2, um, I really strongly encourage you to visit uh, this uh, website, which is hosted by Grid Arndal. Um, the impressive um, lineup of speakers that we have with us today uh, will remain available for questions after their presentations. We would like today's discussion to be as interactive and dynamic uh, and useful, of course, as possible. So please feel free to, to use the chat function or the Q&A function to post your questions while the presenters uh, speak. Um, and then we will field them to the, to, to the panelists. Please indicate who your question is for or whether indeed your question is for the whole panel. And then we will uh, try to reflect as many of these questions as possible in our discussion. To set the stage for today's um, event, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Luis uh, Chuki Uara, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Permanent uh, Mission of Peru to the United Nations in Geneva. Peru is, uh, as you all know, one of the lead sponsors behind a draft resolution to establish an intergovernmental negotiation committee at UNEA 5.2, um, and the ambassador will share his, his, some of his reflections on the process ahead in a video message. So with my Fingers crossed that the technology will be, will be kind to us today. I'd be very grateful if colleagues from Grid Andal could uh, start this video.
Good afternoon to everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the Norwegian Ministry of Climate and Environment and Grit Arendal for organizing this webinar series on the topic of the launch of the negotiations for a new global agreement on plastics pollution. As you might already know, Peru and Rwanda, with a group of countries, are putting, are putting forward a draft resolution to end marine litter and plastic pollution. As of today, 45 member states from di different regions across the world are co-sponsoring this resolution. Azerbaijan, Cabo Verde, Chile, Costa Rica, Ecuador, the European Union and its member states, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Guinea, Kenya, Madagascar, Norway, Philippines, Senegal, Switzerland, Uganda, and United Kingdom join Peru and Rwanda in this endeavor to move forward in addressing marine litter and plastic pollution. We are expecting more countries to support this resolution in the coming days. We believe that moment has come to take concrete actions, in particular at the up upcoming UNEA 5.2. This initiative builds upon previous resolution of the UNEA and is put forward under the firm conviction that greater international measures are needed to prevent and reduce plastic pollution in the environment, including microplastics. The main purpose of the resolution is to convene an Intergovernmental Negotiation Committee, INC, and establish an open mandate for negotiations to develop a new legally binded global instrument. This new legally binded instrument should be based on a comprehensive approach to prevent and reduce plastic pollution in the environment by promoting a circular economy in addressing the, the full life cycle of plastics from production, consumption, and design to waste prevention, management, and treatment. We consider it important to have key elements considered in this future ins instrument, such as shared objective, reporting and, mon and monitoring aspects, national action plans and commitments, scientific and technical support, as well as financial and technical assistance. I am confident that this webinar series will provide an opportunity to learn and exchange knowledge on what a new global agreement on plastic pollution could include and what is needed for it to be an effective tool in solving the challenges related to plastic pollution and marine plastic litter. I would like to thank the organizers again for promoting these webinars, which I am sure will contribute to pave the way towards a new agreement that will tackle such an important issue as plastic solution. Pollution. Thank you very much. Many thanks to the um, ambassador of Peru for those uh, kind words of introduction. I think it sets the stage really nicely for, for today's discussion. Today's event and today's discussion is indeed not a theoretical discussion, but a very real one about what a new uh, global uh, agreement should contain in terms of commitments and obligations specifically related to national action plans, as also uh, mentioned by, by the ambassador in his uh, video message. I'm now very pleased to introduce our first live speaker, if I may, um, Dr. Pei Changbing from the Ministry of Ecology and Environment of the People's Republic of China. As I mentioned, there are already several national and regional initiatives in place to tackle plastic pollution. What is already done at the national and regional level provide, of course, an important starting point for discussions about how national action plans adopted within the framework of a global agreement may look like. I'm therefore very pleased that Dr. Pei uh, has agreed to introduce their national five-year plastic pollution control action plan today as a background for discussion. We are very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say, uh, Dr. Pai. Of course, should anyone wish to ask um, any questions to the presentation, please don't hesitate to write them in the Q&A box. I 
ask to specify that chat is not available for this meeting, but please write your message in the, uh, your questions in the Q&A box, and then we will fill them to the presenters later on in the meeting. But now, please, Dr. Pei, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? We can, can hear you hear loud. Me? I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, so, thank you, Agnes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pei Xiangbin uh, from China. Uh, thank you, the organizer, for inviting me to take part in the events. I'm I'm great honor to be have the chance to introduce marine litter and the plastic. Uh, uh, pollution control in China. My presentation has three parts. One is uh, marine litter management. Two is the life cycle management of plastic waste. Three is about the 14, 14th five years plan, pollution control action plan that was issued this year by NDRC and the MEE. Next, please. Okay. Uh, as a responsible major country, China has always been attached great importance to prevent and control marine litter pollution. China has taken many measures to address marine litter, such as mounting programs, scientific research, remote action, and reading public awareness. Um, marine litter monitoring program uh, and the assessment program was established in the 2007. So a scientific research, uh, including the marine plastic monitoring and the uh, effect assessment and risk project focus on marine plastic pollution monitoring risk assessment and the uh, technical ecological effects. Also China has uh, some the action plan for uh, remove uh, clean up action, including the water pollution prevention and the control also, uh, action plan for the prevention and the control of marine litter in the Bohai Sea. Uh, local government, local province also uh, implement some of the removal action plan. For instance, the Fujian province strengthening the comprehensive management for, management for the floating marine litters. Also, China has many reading, reading public awareness activities. Next, please. So, two part is the life cycle management of plastic waste. Uh, China, according to the life cycle uh, management of plastic waste, so. So China takes the production of the plastic products and the yielding of the plastic products and the general and the collection, recycling and the disposal. 2020, uh, NDRC and the MEE joint released uh, the guideline for the further strengthening the control of the, of the plastic pollution. This guideline including the Main part, next please. Uh, this guideline includes the main part uh, that that's uh, reducing single-use plastic and also uh, developed and use substitute and the uh, ban production and the consumption of thin plastic bag bags and the cover film in agricultural production, also including the use environmentally friendly packaging in delivery and the logistic service. Through innovation, improve the function of plastic production and reduce their cost. Also, including the setup collection station of plastic waste in the prioritized area, the control plastic pollution and reduce the amount of the plastic waste in the landfills. This guideline aims to serve the, our re reuse, our use of single use single plastic products and the mis mismanagement of plastic waste, which will significantly reduce the quantity of plastic waste into the water body and the marine environment. Next, please. Third, I will 
introduction on the introduction of the 14th February plastic pollution control action plan. This action plan uh, was uh, released this year by MEE and uh, uh, NDRC. This action plan includes the four parts gen general requirement, major goals, primary actions, and organization and, and the implementation. Also, this action plan also takes a whole whole chain governance from uh, social reduction, uh, recycling and this disposal, also plastic waste uh, governance. Next please. Uh, the goals by 20, by 2025, uh, the further improve the op operational implementation mechanism for the whole trends of plastic pollution to effectively control plastic pollution. Uh, in detail, social reduction greatly reduced the use of unnecessary plastic products in the key area, such as commodity, retail, e-commerce, takeout service, express delivery, and the hotel service. Plastic waste recycling and the disposal established the system for the domestic waste sorting, uh, collection, delivery, and the disposal. Improve the efficiency of uh, plastic waste recycling and the disposal. Uh, also, including the plastic waste clean up, clean up the plastic waste left over from the past in the key area, effectively. We Control, control the leakage of plastic waste into the marine environment. Next, please. Uh, the action one, uh, promote source reduction of uh, sustainable use, sustainable production and consumption. First, uh, promote the design of sustainable plastic production. Enhance the recyclability of plastic products to improve the environmental performance of them. Ban on the producing ultra thin shopping bags and the agricultural films and the cosmetic products which plastic bees. Uh, second, reduce the unnecessary use of single use plastic products. Uh, impl implement relevant national regulation about banning, restricting sale, and the use of some plastic products, also including the improved public awareness. Third, it promote alter alternatives to the plastic scientifically, promote alternative products like bamboo, wood, papers, and the degradable plastic products by all considerations of environmental impact of the whole life cycle resources. Next, please. Actions two, uh, promote recycling and disposal. So transitioning plastic waste recycling and the disposal. Reasonably laid out and classified the collection facility for domestic waste in public areas. Improve the recycling efficiency of plastic waste in key sectors such as as packaging. Second, establish and improve the plastic waste management system in rural area. Improve the classified collection and the disposal system for the domestic waste in rural area. Uh, generally, in rural area, uh, we have the uh, weak more weak uh, uh, facilities for the domestic waste than uh, urban area. So uh, this action uh, strengths the uh, facility and the collecting disposal system for domestic waste in rural area. Recycling plastic waste in Agricultural, agricultural fishing, such as fishing net. Uh, third, 
increase plastic waste reuse, promote uh, development of plastic waste recycling industry, uh, fourth, improve the plastic waste homely disposal, increase the domestic uh, solid waste incineration facilities, reduce the direct landfills. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, the, folk, for the, folk, the actions uh, focus on the clean up plastic waste in key areas, establish regular clean up mechanism in key areas, such as river basins, bays, beaches, etc., in order to keep free of plastic waste. Establish regular clean up mechanism in tourist attractions, increase garbage like collection facilities and clean collection plastic litter timely. Third, carry out plastic waste clean up in rural areas and clean up the scatters of outdoor plastic waste by village campaign actions. Clean up plastic waste left over from the past. Next, please. Uh, about uh, all actions should be uh, implemented by the many ministry, many sectors, the, and the local uh, governance. So this slide so as uh, cooperation and the action plan. Uh, the every every ministry and the sector and the local government has has his own responsibility uh, on the action plan. Uh, National Development and Reform Commissions uh, respond for the promote of construction uh, garbage incineration facilities and the plastic waste recycling project. Ministry of Ecological and the Environment is responsible for strengthening environmental supervision ban on the garbage Dumpings performing uh, plastic cleanup, especially in coast areas. Also, uh, Minister of Housing, strengthening plastic waste collection and the transportation and the waste sorting collection facilities. Mi Minis Ministry of Agriculture, uh, strengthening the management and clean up garbage in rural area, implement recycling and agricultural film, fishing net and fishing gear, extra. Ministry of Transport waste is responsible waste collection in transportation fields such as shipping, road, camping, the illegal discharge of waste from ship. Next, please. Ministry of Culture and Tourism is responsible for plastic waste governance in tourist attractions. Public sectors strengthening public education and scientific, uh, including the reading public awareness. Ministry of Industry and the Information Technology promoting the design of sustainable plastic production Medical National Medical Port, uh, Port Administration is responsible for ban on the products of cosmetic products contained with plastic microbes. State Post Bureau is responsible for recycling of waste such as express packaging and takeout containers. So local governments and the at all levels, take all responsibility for public plastic pollution control in the administrative areas, strengthening organization and the leadership, improve the working mechanism, clarify the division of uh, responsibility, implement the organization in accordance with the actual situation to ensure the complementation of plastic pollution control objective and the task in this region. Thank you for listening. That's all. 
floor has you. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Pei, for this uh, very rich and uh, comprehensive presentation. I'm really struck by the, the range of detail, range and detail of activities carried out uh, within with, uh, within the, the action plan of, of China. I would also be very interested in hearing more about how your efforts in China may inspire the development of a common commitment for all states to develop and implement national action plans under a global agreement. And I hope that we will have a chance to hear your thoughts on this and, and other questions in the, in the Q&A uh, session afterwards. I see some of you already uh, asking some questions in the Q&A box. Uh, thanks a lot for that. We will field them after the presentations. I will now turn to our next speaker, uh, Jürgen Nieberge from the University of Copenhagen. Jürgen has spent a lot of his time over the past months thinking and writing about the plans that China and I believe eight other countries have made at a national level to deal with plastics and plastic pollution. He is also based on that research made some recommendation uh, to the elaboration of national action plans under a new global agreement. And we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to, to say, Jürgen. As always, should you have any questions to Jürgen, please don't hesitate to write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. With that, over to you, Jürgen. Thank you. Just give me a second to start this. No problem at all. Just take your time. It's lagging a bit for some reason. Can you see my screen now? I can see your screen, but it's somehow a bit zoomed in for some reason. Okay. Ah, perfect. Now we're in. This okay. is uh, yeah. If you just go to the to the front, um, yeah, you might be already on the front uh, slide. Okay. Well, I for some reason I can't go back to the first slide. Okay, that's okay. Well, that's um, interesting. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation, um, and I'm very happy to be here to present my research or our research on national action plans. Um, we're um, presenting a report written by me together with Torbjörn Grafhugo from the Norwegian Academy of International Law, and it's a report on, well, it's basically a comparative study of selected national action plans um, with the purpose of informing the development of national obligations under a potential new agreement on plastic pollution. Um, and national action plans have been frequently mentioned by um, governments, academics, civil society as a potential element of this agreement. Um, and despite the details and content not being entirely clear, generally the purpose of national action plans is to spell out how a state is planning to tackle an issue within their respective jurisdictions and to meet the goals of a global agreement. And we already know Plastic or action plans very well from and the climate change regime, the Convention on Biodiversity, and other um, multilateral environmental agreements. And the report basically compiles and compares nine national action plans and assesses their commonalities, strengths, weaknesses, and potential areas of improvement. And the nine jurisdictions we looked into are Australia, Canada, Chile, China, France, Ghana, Indonesia, Sweden, and Vanuatu. And where relevant, we have also looked into ASEAN and the EU and what they do at their levels or the regional level. And the findings and conclusions and reflections have been used to formulate six recommendations for elements to be, or that we think should be included in such a global, global agreement. And these are just the, the plans. Um, there are nine of them, um, and most of them are passed, as you can see, either this year or last year. And in our analysis, we looked at five groups of elements. Um, and this is also how we have structured our analysis. We looked at framing, scope, and approaches, objectives and goals, measures and mechanisms, monitoring and reporting mechanisms, and institutional and administrative arrangements. And we're going to look briefly at what we mean by these now. So for framing, scope, and approaches, framing is basically how the issue is tackled by the plan um, and how it is described and understood. And we have grouped together four to different types of framing, um, pollution and waste management issues, regularity issue, plastics issue, and marine litter issue. Um, and the scopes, the plans have very different scopes, which is what they actually tackle. Um, most of the plans have adopted a quite comprehensive scope, 
recover all types and all sources of plastic pollution, both land-based and sea-based, um, so-called comprehensive scope. While others, um, Chile, for instance, which only focuses on plastic packaging, or France, which only focuses on marine plastic waste, have more narrowly defined scopes. We have also looked into life cycle approaches, which we were happy to see that most of the plants have adopted. Um, and this means that they include both upstream, midstream, and downstream measures in their plants. Um, and even though most of the plants follow this approach, some of them only focus on um, so more, um, more um, elements like waste management or consumer behavior. We have also identified a so-called cross-sectoral approach to implementation, which means that instead of thinking plastic pollution as an environmental problem entirely in um, some silo in the Ministry of the Environment, um, some of the plans recognize the, the need and the importance of thinking outside the box and to involve different sectors of society and the government, for instance, education ministries and sector, health, finance, et cetera, to effectively tackle plastic pollution. We have also identified or looked at two levels of objectives and goals. Objectives are the, the overarching policy objectives that guide the actions in the plans. Some of them are qualitative, some of them are quantitative. Some of them have clearly stipulated timelines. Some of them are very vague and others are quite concrete. And they range from, um, which is the Ghanaian objective to comprehensively manage plastics, which is quite vague, to very concrete objectives such as the um, Indonesian one, which is, which is to reach 70% reduction in plastic waste by 2025. We also have goals, which are more concrete or concretization of the objectives that give some more detail and specific on the actual measures to be included in the plans. And these, as with the objectives, are vague and concrete and quantitative and qualitative. I'll show you a few examples now. So these are just two examples from the Chinese and the Chilean plants um, respectively. And you can see that there's a big difference in whether and how they're formulated and whether they're quantitative or qualitative. And this has a huge influence on the um, action and understanding of the plants and the issues. We also have four categories of measures and mechanisms, which are the, the meat on the bones of the plants. We have product regulation and technical requirements. We have procurement, EPR, and market instruments. Then we have this neat category with everything else, with other measures and mechanisms, um, school curriculum changes, awareness raising, measures and campaigns, um, promotion of plastic alternatives like bamboo. Um, and also we're, we're curious to see, and we find it interesting that some of the plants also um, envis in, envisage a important role for civil society. Um, in the Indonesian plant, for instance, NGOs are given a, a role in the implementation committees at the government level. They're not just asked politely or what they think at the end of or right before implementation, but they're actually part of the decision-making procedures. While in Ghana, faith-based communities are also given a big role in awareness raising Twitter networks and followers. Um, just to give two examples of how the plants interact with and involve civil society of different types. We also looked at six types of mechanisms that support and enable monitoring, reporting, reporting and democratic oversight and participation in jurisdictions with a culture for this. So some of the plants have timelines, which basically stipulates when a specific action is supposed to end and begin, or at least when it's supposed to start. We looked at different reporting requirements and mechanisms for both government agencies on how they are implementing the plan, but also for businesses. Um, Midterm review is an interesting thing where the plan is reviewed in the middle of a period if it has such a time period, and then modifications or alterations are made if necessary. We also looked at different follow-up and performance indicators that allows for progress to be continually measured. We also looked at a gap analysis, which we'll come back to in a few slides. Um, and also a final evaluation of the plans of the implementation. And sometimes, or some of the plans, this um, final evaluation is supposed to be done by a third party. Finally, um, we have some different institutional and administrative arrangements. Um, basically, and some of the plans outline the creation of new coordination and implementation committees or bodies, um, either 
completely new ones um, that are established independently of other agencies or bodies or new bodies within existing institutions, for instance, a interministerial committee or some kind of cooperation committee that's hosted by a ministry or an agency and that involves other players from the government and civil society. We also have this third category here of division of roles and responsibilities, which is, it sounds like a no brainer, but it's really not present in the plans. And we find that curious to see that by explicitly designating a responsible ministry or agency or sector, either per action or per type of action of the whole document, you can create a lot of account, you can create accountability and transparency in the plan and help both the government itself, but also citizens in understanding um, what is going on and how it is being implemented. And finally, our six recommendations uh, for the National Action Plan under a global agreement. And these are based on a review of the elements in the nine plans and what we think are good, well thought out and effective mechanisms. Number one, to ground the measures and actions in a gap analysis. And a gap analysis is a type of analysis that compares the current situation in a jurisdiction with where we want to be, for instance, by looking at global goals and that the concrete actions are based on this gap. Number two, based on national action plans on quantitative goals and objectives. They can of course also be qualitative goals and objectives, but having quantitative um, indicators of some kind to, just to allow the actual progress to be measured. Number three, include concrete actions and implementation timelines. Number four, clearly define roles and responsibilities in the implementation to clearly designate a sector, an agency, or a level of government to create accountability and transparency of implementation. Number five, incorporate midterm and final review mechanisms, potentially to be conducted by third parties. And number six, incorporate reporting requirements for both the government and other relevant stakeholders. And the government agencies could report on their progress and efforts, while businesses, for instance, could be required to report on recycled content in the products or clean up efforts they make. And that's it. Um, a very quick overview and sorry for pushing through so fast, but please have a look at the report if you're interested and I look forward to the Q&A session. Thanks very much, um, Jürgen. Uh, great presentation. Um, and I'm sorry that we don't, don't have, have more time. I think we, we could have really listened to, 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 to you for much longer. Um, and I, I hope that we'll be able to dig into the detail a little bit more in, in the Q, Q and a uh, session afterwards. I think the, the category, categories that you introduce um, uh, in, in, in your report provide a really great basis for discussing how, how a national action plan commitment in a global agreement uh, can look like. And the recommendations, at least in my view, provide a very, very useful guidance uh, indeed. Um, a number of... Um, uh, people in the audience, they ask where uh, this report can be found, where they can access it. And I understand that it's not yet been uh, published, but that it will be published uh, on uh, marineliterhub.com, the same website where you can find recordings of these uh, webinars, if I'm not mistaken. So we will follow up with you on, on that point. Um, I will now turn to our last two uh, speakers. Uh, Heidi uh, Savelli Soderberg from UNEP and Karen Raubenheimer from the Australian National Centre for Ocean Resources and Security Anchors. Uh, these speakers are, I believe, known to, to most of you. They have both given a lot of thought into how an obligation to develop and implement national action plan under a new global agreement uh, on plastics uh, might look like. The Nordic report, um, as, as introduced earlier, uh, includes a whole annex with possible elements and actions to consider in preparation of, of so-called national plastic management plans. So very grateful uh, to you, um, uh, Heidi and, and Karen, that you've agreed to join us. Um, you, Karen, in the middle of the uh, Australian uh, night, so really appreciate your dedication. Um, as always, uh, should anyone wish to ask uh, any questions, uh, please continue uh, to um, just write them in the Q&A box uh, that you can access on the bottom uh, of the screen. So without further ado, um, I'm now giving the floor to first, I believe, uh, you, Heidi, um, and then to, to, to continue with Karen afterwards to, to hear your, your perspectives. Over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting us to share some thoughts here on the issue of national action plans. 
Uh, UNEP has been supported in development of action plans since 2008 through the regional CIS conventions and action plans, and has lately also through UNEA, if we go to the next slide, uh, to the UN Environment Assembly, been requested to also support the implementation and development of action plans on marine litter and plastic pollution in the first three UNEAs. And um, following that, it's also been uh, encouraged to promote action in the framework of the regional CIS conventions and programs that are key uh, actors in this space. Um, we were also requested in UNEA 4 to look at the, the issue of indicators and recommend indicators taking into account key sources of marine litter, including plastic litter and microplastics in cooperation with relevant international organizations. So this work is underway and Carol will cover a bit more on it after me. And we've also been asked to establish and maintain a database of technical and scientific information related to the topic, such as inventories of discharge. So here, Global Partnership Marine Litter Digital Platform has been established, which we believe can serve a crucial role going forward also in how we exchange and collect information and make it available to inform and facilitate the development implementation, but also potentially tracking of, of the aspects related to national action plans. We know that there is a lot of work underway. There are several entities supporting action plans. Many countries, many regions have action plans already. So of course, drawing on what has been done already is a crucial aspect. And here we've then initiated also a GPML action track on action plans specifically that may be regional, national or sector specific, where we hope to both collect lessons learned and uh, challenges as well as needs so that we can best provide the support that countries or actors may need in developing such plans, but also try to convene all the actors that are working in this space so that we can identify the best approaches, use multiple methodologies and come together in something that could be streamlined and yet flexible. So I'll hand over to Karen here and thanks again. Uh, I should unmute. Thank you, Heidi. Um, just to also sort of reiterate um, at the UNIA level that uh, UNIA resolution 3 slash 7 also encouraged countries to develop and implement action plans um, for preventing marine litter. And it also gave some of the measures that could be focused on, such as the redesign and reuse of products and materials, encouraging resource efficiency, increasing collection and recycling rates of plastic waste, and avoiding the unnecessary use of plastic and plastic containing chemicals of particular concern. So there's some guidance there already for action plans. Um, but as we know, at the core of an information driven action plan is obviously the data. So as part of the agreement, we need to develop indicators to help harmonize the minimum level of data collected. And we've alluded to some of that in the previous discussions. So the aim of developing indicators is obviously to guide action, but also to identify gaps as mentioned and priorities and to facilitate target setting and the measuring of progress. But also then to provide metrics that are comparable across countries and are consistent over time. These indicators could underpin the activities of action plans and the reporting process in particular. So the development of uh, national action plans would likely be a central commitment under a potential agreement. The agreement itself could set out the objectives and goals of the agreement and the targets and timelines and hopefully also a process for adopting indicators. But the national action plan should then mirror this at a minimum and could then provide further detail that is tailored to meet the specific national needs and circumstances, particularly for developing and implementing national policies across the whole life cycle of plastics. The national action plans could also provide opportunities to design a holistic and comprehensive national approach that covers all the locally relevant sources and sectors, as we've heard before. But overall, they should work towards achieving the fundamental objective and strategic goals of the agreement. So the core functions of national action plans could be to achieve the fundamental objective and strategic goals of a potential agreement, as mentioned, uh, to raise political awareness and preparedness to adopt national plastic policies, to promote institutional innovation and coordination across the policy sectors, and to enhance access to financial and technical support. So it's also important to note, as Heidi said, that a lot of work has already been um, um, started and is underway for most of these points already. 
So the form and structure of the action plans could also be a high level strategic document. This could foster a cross-sectoral approach and leverage financial resources and engage relevant stakeholders. Or the national action plan could be more detailed and prescriptive. It could operationalize the high level strategic document and outline more specific measures. It could also identify those entities responsible for implementation, estimate financing sources for each of the measures and specify institutional arrangements for implementation and monitoring. But then the action plan could also be a hybrid of these and include elements of both types. So as we heard, national action plans have been employed by many of the MEAs. Normally the action plan mechanism is outlined in general terms in the agreement and then specific guidance for their, for their development in terms of substance and procedure is, is often adopted at a, at a later stage. So if we look at some examples, we heard about the, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which obliges party to, parties to regularly prepare their climate plan, known as nationally determined contributions. And the agreement gives parties flexibility in developing those NDCs and in determining their mitigation pledges. This made it fairly easy for countries to join the convention and to develop their NDCs. Um, and many parties have formulated their NDCs as high level strategic documents which are then underpinned by more detailed action plans or roadmaps that set out how the objectives will be met. So an important feature of the NDCs is that they need to represent a progression from previous NDCs and reflect the highest possible ambition. And here Annex 1 of the Paris Rulebook adopted in 2018 provides guidance on the information required, which will then help clarify transparency and understanding of the NDCs, but it doesn't really specify the content of the measures. So the Paris Agreement reflects a hybrid approach, which blends a bottom-up flexibility to promote broad participation with a top-down rules to promote accountability and ambition. And then if we look at the CBD that was also mentioned previously, uh, this requires parties to develop national biodiversity strategy and action plans. And in 2010, the CBD adopted the strategic plan for biodiversity uh, that includes 20 time-bound um, HD biodiversity targets, and parties were asked to develop and implement an updated action plan by 2015, and to set their own national targets um, in these action plans by using the HD biodiversity targets as a flexible reference. While the flexibility to develop the national targets has helped parties take into account the national priorities and capacities, it has led to the use of different targets in the action plans which then weakened the comparability. So importantly, parties were also asked to reflect the full range of activities of all biodiversity related conventions in their action plans. And then in the Nordic report, we suggested four strategic goals for the new agreement that could be um, developed. These are listed on the left-hand side here, and these could be translated into national targets in the action plans with outcome indicators and also impact indicators listed and then ensure that monitoring programs are in place to track progress of those indicators towards the targets. Um, and as Heidi mentioned, uh, work is being done on developing indicators um, as you need to present to at UNEA 5.2, uh, progress on these indicators, and um, that will hopefully then assist countries in also using indicators to measure actions within their action plans. So just to end off and summarize the role of national action plans, parties to a potential agreement could commit to develop and agree international sustainability criteria. We've been talking about the design of products and these sustainability criteria could help guide that design element at a global level. Um, these sustainability criteria at the international level um, could then as part of another commitment by parties be elaborated in national plastic sustainability standards. So these are then translated at the national level which are then integrated into regulatory and market-based instruments, uh, such as bans, taxes, and EPR schemes. So these regulatory and market-based instruments could be supported by a number of other measures, all of which should then be detailed in a national action plan, which should also be one of the commitments of parties to the agreement. So I hope that's given you a little bit of um, further background or um, thought on what the international level of action plans could be. Thank you. Indeed. Thanks very much to both of you, uh, Heidi and, and Karen. Um, extremely useful perspectives. There is guidance, good guidance, I believe, 
for, for, for negotiating over a potential global agreement to sort of have a view, a concrete view of what uh, a commitment to, to develop and, and implement nat national action plans may, may look like. And, and particularly valuable, I think, that in your, in your work, you've also looked at national action plans on other issues under other agreements. You mentioned the CBD, the UNFCCC, the Paris Agreement. Of course, developing national action plans on issues of common concern is, is not a new idea. Uh, but there may perhaps be ways to strengthen the development and, and implementation of such plans, and that's I think where we where we need to where we need to go uh, on, on this particular issue as well. So happy that you brought in this this additional dimension. Um, we will now do a round of questions and answers, um, and the speakers have kindly agreed to take uh, questions from the audience. And I have already received uh, a number of questions. Uh, we will try to field as many uh, of them as possible in a somehow structured manner. Should you have additional questions, please, please feel free to, to post them in the Q&A box. But if I may start um, with a question to you, um, Dr. Pei, or rather a, a set of questions that were received uh, regarding your, your national action plan. There is a question about how the a national action plan uh, or the implementation of it rather is monitored and also whether there are, are measurable, measurable indicators uh, for, 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 for implementation. Um, and also added to that, the monitoring, whether, what, is the, what is the timeline uh, for achieving uh, the goals uh, associated with, with China's um, five-year um, action plan. So that's a group of questions about how monitoring of implementation of the action plan is done. And I think related to that, if you are able to say anything about what the results so far from this action plan has been in terms of output outcome, what has this action plan so far uh, led to? So um, may I ask you to 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 address these uh, or some of these questions, uh, Dr. Pei, if you can hear me. Hello. Hello. Wonderful. Okay. okay. I try to answer your question. Uh, you know, I work in the de uh, Department of Ecological uh, Marine Environment. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, okay. Uh, you know, I work I work in the Department of Marine Ecological. Uh, uh, yes, but you know, I'm not working in the uh, solid waste management sectors. Also, I'm not uh, work for uh, uh, NDRC. So I try to answer your question. But uh, from uh, marine leaders, you we have monitoring and uh, assessment program. So every year uh, we uh, 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 developed, uh, we, we make the uh, marine leaders, uh, including the beach uh, and uh, uh, coast waters. Also, including the you know in the mm, uh, you know bottom of the uh, you know uh, bed you know. So we we uh, we monitor the marine density, and also this this indicators so as the uh, the the outcome of uh, cleaning up uh, uh, waste and also uh, the actual plan, the outcome. If the, we have the data uh, uh, in the coast of waters, uh, the densities, uh, so we know maybe uh, these areas, uh, the, the local government, uh, in the areas, uh, the local government take a more, uh, more activities, more actions to, to clean up the, uh, the marine litters. For instance, in Fujian uh, province, the coastal waters, now it's less and less the marine litters. 
because this government takes the more uh, measures, uh, actions to clean up uh, the meritors also related to the uh, to the uh, uh, the garbage, and uh, also they established uh, much more the facilities for the domestic uh, uh, waste. So reduce the uh, re reduce also reduce the single use the plastic products. Also, we can uh, uh, this uh, this monitoring indicators also show us the single use plastic re reduction. So we can uh, you know uh, classify classification of the uh, collect. Collected the, the items. Uh, this uh, uh, monitoring. So every year, the monitor uh, we take the uh, monitoring uh, monitoring programs. But uh, for the uh, monitoring the the whole the action plan, uh, from now, uh, from my knowledge, every uh, ministry. Every sector, our local government should uh, uh, make the annual report to uh, to our NDRC and the MEE to report the outcome of the uh, implementation of action plan. Also, local province should make the annual report according to the action plans the contents, action plan the, the, the goals and the activities. The, the two uh, monitoring and uh, assessment, this is my answers. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Pai. Very, very useful. Uh, it's interesting to see, of course, as a general reflection, if I may, how uh, critical both monitoring um, and reporting uh, is to sort of incentivize or to motivate uh, implementation of this uh, of these action plans. And I think that's maybe something sort of a lesson that we can also think about as we as we at, at the international level. I may have um, more or the audience may have other questions for you uh, later on, uh, Dr. Perry, so please stay online. I just wanted now to turn to, we have received a number of other questions as well to the other panelists. And uh, Jürgen, I wanted to turn to, uh, to you now. Um, a number of uh, people in the audience are asking uh, about these nine uh, case studies that you uh, selected. And specifically, why did you choose these nine case studies? Um, what were the criteria that you that you that you employed uh, in, in that selection process? And then, a second and related question, I think: uh, Would you say that one or more of these national action plans um, that you have studied could be held up as representing, in a sense, be best practice? Are some of them, in your view, better than than others? Uh, or did your sort of six recommendation reflect the best features of several of the national action plans that you studied? So I think a pretty, pretty straightforward question there as to your opinion about who's best in class in a sense and where should we where should, who should we look for, for for guidance on this over to you Jürgen. well thank you for the questions um i'm going to start with the last question i think it's because the plans are so different in terms of their purpose some of them are vaguely formulated roadmaps that only aim to suggest actions for policymakers to to look into like the swedish plan while others are um, hard implementation plans with deadlines and timelines and sanctioning mechanisms. It's impossible to compare them. Um, so the recommendations are definitely based on the best elements from all nine. Um, but some of them are, have more, or if if our recommendations are are the, the best effort, um, then some of the plans contain more of the recommendations than others. But I don't want to say that any of the plans are better. Some of them have very strong elements on reporting, for instance. Um, the Ghanaian plan is really strong in reporting um, with detailed instruments and mechanisms and processes, but it's really vague on single use plastic. It doesn't really tackle anything beyond reporting. Um, while the Indonesian plan details very 
very well. Um, the division of responsibilities and clearly defines tasks and deadlines and start and end dates for all actions that it proposes or contains, which it's also quite good. But the content is also quite vague. Um, and for the first question, um, we have based our selection on, first of all, uh, whether or not the country has um, substantial regulation or legislation or plans on marine or on plastic pollution. And then we we'll try to have a geographical balance between different countries and continents, but also to have a representative selection of legal systems and culture and levels of development. So I think we managed to have quite a broad selection of different types of countries and different types of plans. That's it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Jürgen. That is, that is very clear and also quite uh, diplomatic uh, in, in your response, uh, which I'm sure is appreciated. Um, usually appreciate that. I also have a question. Now we have some questions also uh, from the audience. Please, if you have more questions, also sort of following up on, on the discussions that we're having now, please don't hesitate to post them in the Q&A box at the bottom, bottom of the screen. Uh, the more questions we have, the more I think uh, the richer our discussion is going to be. We would like to address as, as to the extent possible the, the, the concerns and, 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 and questions that, that you have in the audience. Now we have some um, um, uh, questions for you, Karen, if I may ask you to, to, to turn on your, or your camera, and maybe you also want to, to say a few words about this, uh, Heidi. Um, there was a question about how you think coordination among existing action plans under different multilateral environmental agreements um, and possible national action plans uh, could be uh, secured. Um, so you have uh, all these existing national action plans uh, adopted under, under different regimes, CBD, UNFCCC, possible now some plastics, and there are other examples as well. Is there any scope for sort of uh, collaboration or somehow some, uh, some synergies there in how these, these action plans are, are, are both developed, I guess, and, and implemented? So that was the, was the first question. And to add on to that, uh, one, one question that that uh, that came to mind uh, was considering that that many states and indeed some some regions, as noted by Jürgen, have already developed national action plans on plastics or something similar to it. Might they they might not correspond fully to to the vision and as outlined in your presentation. But how do we sort of integrate what has already been done with a potential commitment to develop new plans um, uh, in a in an um, uh, in, in a new agreement. So over to you, Karen. Thank you. Um, I, I think this problem is not uh, unique to the action plans, but also to the agreement itself. Um, and it, it requires um, a mapping as well. So mapping out what is being um, achieved by each of the different MEAs um, and then working out what's, what's left, uh, what are the gaps. And that's really what you want to then tackle with your action plan or with the agreement. So you don't want duplication, um, firstly. And uh, if we map those out correctly, you can then also map out the reporting requirements under each of them. And that's another area where we don't want duplication either because it's, it's, it's very intensive on a lot of countries who are already struggling to report on all of these different um, MEAs and action plans and progress. So I think we really need to undertake a, quite a, a good mapping exercise here to make sure that we are not overlapping measures and we're not overlapping uh, reporting requirements. Um, this is also what we've been doing with the indicator work is to not come in with new um, indicators, but try and use what's already there. Um, possibly disaggregation for plastics. Uh, so there may be areas where, um, you know, the, the CBD might be dealing more with the impacts of, of uh, plastic that's leaked into the environment, whereas your so that component could be covered under that action plan potentially. But if you are looking at design of your, of your products um, and bands, that's unlikely to be in anything else. Um, and that's what I really hope the action plans are going to cover a lot more is this design component, because I think it's so crucial to the long-term solution here is to get the design right um, and get the reduction going. And I, I don't think we're gonna see that, those types of measures in other action plans. Um, but to go to the, the second question um, on those that already have action plans, um, some of those action plans are time bound. I think um, 
China's a five-year plan, for instance, and then it gets reviewed. Uh, that's an opportunity to then bring it in line with what's been agreed under a potential agreement. Um, there may also be exemptions, some type of exemption that if you already have one, you've got five years to review it and look at it, um, you know, something like that. Um, I think we could work something through that, that allows countries to use what they've got. Um, but then also, as we've got now this assessment of what has been done is to try and look at that and, and elevate that into the new global agreement so that we're almost um, making use of those um, and, and learning from them along the way as well. Um, but I'd, I'd also just like to comment on, on what Jürgen was saying um, with some of the action plans that, you know, they all sit in a, a regulatory framework as well um, that needs to be taken into account. So, uh, for instance, in Australia, we've actually banned the export of plastic waste, which has driven our action plan quite a lot, whereas that export ban wouldn't be possible in Pacific Islands, for instance, who are going to rely heavily on on export of plastic waste, um, more than likely under the Basel Convention Amendment. So, you know, th those sorts of things, we do have to look at the, the local context as well. And we need to sort of balance that harmonization of action plans so we get comparability with, with the flexibility. And that's that's always the challenge, I think. Brilliant. Okay. Compa Bit of a long answer. No, that's that's brilliant. Comparability with flexibility. That sounds like uh, that sounds like like really good advice. Just wanted to also move to to Heidi. Uh, if you could uh, please turn on your on your camera again. Um, to uh, there's a question here coming from the audience whether UNEP has undertaken any partnerships with other intergovernmental organizations uh, and or environmental multilateral agreements, so their secretariats, I assume, um, when supporting countries in the development and implementation of uh, national action plans. And uh, so follow, following up on this, are there any best practices or lessons learned that we can look at in, 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 you know, in the process of developing a national action plan already now before a global agreement has indeed been uh, negotiated? So uh, it would be great if you could, uh, could uh, share your reflections on that, Heidi. Sure, thank you for that question, uh, Walter. And uh, yes, we have been working where, for example, now when we're looking at the regional level action plan for the Abidjan Convention, we also engaged with FAO and IMO to ensure that the consideration of sea-based sources is also included. And I think there are a number of opportunities also at national level where we're looking at Kenya with FAO also engaged in developing action plans. So really try to bring together where possible different intergovernmental organizations and uh, ensure that we are developing or supporting the development or implementation of something in coordination and with good synergies amongst the different agencies. As I flag, there are, there are a number of actors in, in this space. And by in, in the beginning, when you're starting working on a national action plan, the, the stakeholder mapping and the, the is crucial in looking at who is operating within a country, who is doing what in terms of activities, who has an, an interest in being part of supporting the development. And already at that stage, you can then identify who are the key actors, at, whether they are intergovernmental or national or regional. And you can also identify which activities are they supporting or planning to support. So you can actually map up then where are the gaps where there isn't support at the moment, but then engage and working with UN country teams also within countries to engage all, all agencies. Um, as part of the collaboration that is also ongoing is coordination with Basel Convention, for example, CBD and other MEAs, and of course the regional CIS conventions and action plans. So yeah, this is a, a central part of kind of the process that we envisage for developing action plans. Uh, it's really mapping and engaging the different stakeholders that are relevant to the issue at hand. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much indeed. That is that is uh, extremely uh, useful um, and, and and very clear. I think uh, just building a little bit uh, upon that in terms of how national action plans have been developed and and how they may be be developed also uh, under a new global agreement. I guess a question that maybe to maybe to you or or the other panelists. Um, maybe first uh, he hear you a little bit more from you, Heidi. Is what the role of sort of non-state entities, um, including private sector actors businesses, industry actors, and civil society should be in the development of uh, an implementation of, of, of national action plans. What sort of the 
experiences and, and lessons uh, that we have so far are telling us? Well, they are, yes, they, they are of course crucial here, uh, especially when you're doing, again, uh, kind of your stakeholder mapping. You can look at who is operating in the space and who is already engaged, but you can also look at what type of data and information are telling, what it's telling you about, for example, if you do a snapshot monitoring and a brand audit, you can identify which are the sectors that need to be part of the discussion because a lot of potentially what you're finding in the environment is coming as a contribution from these sectors. And by having that evidence, it's also in an opportunity to engage in a dialogue and highlight both the risks and the opportunities to that sector in terms of uh, how they can engage and be part of the solution. So the stakeholder mapping in the beginning is crucial, but also kind of stakeholder consultations and a general awareness that there is an action plan that will be implemented, that there is an opportunity. This is how you are, how you can engage in this. This is how you shape it. And this is the role that you can play. So participatory processes essential for, uh, for development of both act national and regional action plans. Brilliant, thanks very much, Heidi, very useful. And I think we have some comments as well in the Q&A uh, section where uh, actually they, they see that in, in existing in specific countries, uh, national action plan is a, an example here of in, in Kenya where a national plastic action plan has been uh, developed by a manufacturer's association, which is of course somewhat removed from the from the agencies of, of, of the state. So that's also useful to, to look at. And thanks very much for, for the person that submitted that comment. I could I think... comment uh, briefly on, on this. Yeah. Okay, in, please go ahead. In Kenya, we, we did a workshop back in 2019 and we're continuing this work, but that was again, looking at identifying what is existing already. Uh, we work with UN Habitat also in identifying what are waste flows within cities. I saw there was a question on that too. So you can actually target and identify what are both policy solutions, but also what might be infrastructure solutions at the city level, for example. So looking at both national and subnational levels. Thank you. Brilliant. Very useful. Thank you. Karen, um, you have your hand raised. Uh, great to hear that you might want to come in on this particular topic as well. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also think with the action plans, you are hopefully going to be setting some targets and and that needs to be done in consultation with the industry. Um, particularly if you're going to target specific types of, of applications, so particular single use plastics, etc. I think those targets should be um, set together with industry um, also to get the buy-in from industry on it. And then so that's one area of, of the, the consultation that needs to happen, but industry is also, and, and civil society and NGOs are probably also going to play a role in collecting the data um, or providing the data that will go towards measuring progress towards the indicators that you've set um, and then towards those targets. So I think it's important to, as Heidi said, first map them out and then understand what they're doing and then what they can contribute and then potentially whether they need assistance or funding to provide that information. Um, I think, I think the, the, the um, monitoring is, is very important in developing countries to include the civil society sectors and other sectors because um, and it's unlikely in most countries that governments are gonna provide a massive monitoring program to collect all that data. So I think it's, it's very important to consult and include the various sectors in that. Thanks. Lynn, thanks very much. A very clear recommendation uh, there. We'd also be probably interested in hearing what, what uh, Jürgen and, and Dr. Pei thinks about this, but I just wanted to also throw another question uh, out here, and that relates to, of course, a crucial issue, as I think mentioned by, by many of you, is how to ensure implementation of national action plans once they have been adopted. And we've seen that, to some extent, reporting um, I mean, how they developed will, uh, if they are developed through a broad consultation, including all relevant stakeholders, that will impact on their expected implementation rate. And we also see that there are measures that can be introduced, such as reporting requirements, for instance, uh, under under national action plan that might also incentivize um, implementation. I just wanted to ask specifically, and I'm asking to the entire panel now, if you have any reflections on this um, regarding the, the crucial question of, of money financing, which is of course something that we're gonna discuss more in depth in a later uh, webinar, but is absolutely critical, of course, for the purposes of developing a global agreement. So I just wondered how, if you have any um, 
ideas already now of how implementation of national action plans can be can be best financed at the national level, but also at the, at the global level, and what kind of mechanisms can be established uh, globally to sort of help or uh, assist uh, implementation of, of such action plans. So this is sort of a question to to, to all panelists. Please raise your raise your raise your hand if you have any uh, any, any questions. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Karen. Really appreciate that. Back to you. Thanks. Uh, yes, I think it is. It is all about money, um, and uh, this is potentially one of the value adds of a global agreement. In that, um, funding can be um, channeled through the agreement, for, at least for the development of the action plans, um, any of the socio-economic studies that might need to happen um, to work out, um, you know. What, how plastics are being used, um, how they flow through the market, and then the impacts of any um, activities that you might want to undertake through, through the action plan. Um, so that's one angle. The other angle is um, something like container deposit schemes may want to be, you know, you might want to implement those, but there's, there's set up money that's required for that. Um, you know, you, bottles will start coming in and you've got to pay a deposit, but you haven't actually got the money from anyone yet. So, so there's, there's that sort of um, assistance that could be helped um, through, the, through the global agreement. But then I'm also a big supporter of, of the market-based instruments and the economic instruments. Um, and I think this is really a key area and some of them can be quite simple. Um, you know, they, some of them can be very complicated like the EPR schemes, but this is really where we have to start looking at the flow of plastics through the market and so sort of those entry points of where we can extract small amounts of funding along the way from the various um, you know, actors in the value chain, including the consumers, um, so that it can uh, support or just subsidize waste management. Um, it doesn't have to pay for it entirely because you just wanna keep those, that industry profitable. And I think it's, it's about getting those um, types of measures in place that are very context specific. Um, and that's why these action plans are going to require a lot of flexibility as well. But to me, that's one of the key things is, is to maintain um, that, that sort of sustainable financing at the domestic level. And that can come through many things such as um, tourist taxes as well, um, all sorts of things. But you know, I think there has to be a cutoff point where um, it becomes self-sustaining at the domestic level. Thanks. Oh, just, just one other thing as well, and um, yeah. which um, was was alluded to earlier around the the roles and responsibilities. So setting up your lead agencies and supporting agencies for each of your actions is probably also another measure which helps, which um, Jürgen did talk about. Thanks. Indeed. No, thanks very much. Very very helpful. Um, we don't have any further. Uh, Questions. There are some questions that are of a rather factual uh, nature that I think we can follow up on in uh, writing. Uh, if there are any other um, broad questions that you would like to ask to the to the panelists, please go ahead so uh, and, and indicate uh, that now. Um, I wanted to, um, uh, but 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 otherwise, if there are, we 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 have about ten minutes left of our allotted time. If we if we want uh, if we want to share any any additional reflections, so just wanted to give um, uh, the, the the panelists, uh, Dr. Pai and and, and Jurgen and, and and Heidi, and also Karen here, the opportunity before we close to share maybe some some concluding uh, reflections on this particular topic. As of course um, we we. We, um, we move into the um, now considering the adoption of a negotiation mandate in the run-up to UNEA 5.2 and, and the potential negotiation of, of a new uh, new agreement. So maybe I can start, uh, go back to you, uh, Dr. Pai, for some uh, final um, concluding remarks. And uh, also, if you, if I, if I may, uh, just add on to that, ask you something that I'm particularly interested in, based on your experiences with implementing the National Action Plan on Plastics in China, what would be sort of your key recommendations to the development of a commitment at a global level uh, to, um, to develop such uh, action plans? So what are sort of the national experiences that you have and how do they um, reflect your, your recommendations for the global level? So very much appreciate if you can, if you can uh, 
turn on your camera again, Dr. Pai, and, and share your final reflection. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, thank you for your, they were chance to the final remark. It's uh, very lucky for me. First, firstly, I uh, appreciate uh, that you uh, invite me to take uh, part in the event. Also, I'm very happy to see the Heidi and the professor the, uh, from Australia uh, in virtual meetings. So I'm very happy. So before this, I, I, I see them in many times in the uh, in the, the meetings like this. So uh, second, from the, my experience uh, on the national action plan, but uh, you know, different countries maybe have a different uh, circumstances. So national action plan uh, should uh, be based on the national circumstances. So, you know, uh, uh, different, uh, a different uh, develop, development levels, different, uh, you know, the people's living habitat. Also, maybe have a different uh, problems, but uh, also uh, for, 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 for instance, in China, but uh, 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 central government uh, requests the local government to clean up the, the, the existing the plastic waste this is the, 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 the task. The local government also take the, uh, uh, take the task, take the activities to uh, clean the, the key area, areas, the plastic waste, uh, the left, uh, maybe left hour from the past, maybe uh, two or, or three or maybe uh, 10 years ago. Also, the, the, this is a, a, a task. Another, so uh, this is a, in China maybe uh, the gave the responsibility to the to the mm, uh, to the to the local communities. Uh, this uh, experience. Second, uh, maybe you know uh, the the ban uh, of uh, single-use plastic uh, 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 the policy is effect effectively. But you know, uh, the, some the, the hostel service now uh, uh, do, uh, don't provide the single-use plastic. Maybe it, it's, uh, it's very effectively. But also uh, for national action plans, also maybe, mm, uh, you know, uh, enhance the, uh, the capacity buildings. For instance, uh, establish of uh, facilities for the domestic uh, waste. Yes, but uh, we have a very two times, uh, two minutes left. So a final remark. So I, I'm very, uh, I'm really appreciate for that. Also, I'm very happy to be here to, to uh, exchange the, the opinions and, uh, and uh, communicate, communicate with the colleague. So thank you for uh, uh, telling me the remarks. Right, thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Dr. Poe. Really appreciated your, your, your contributions to this, uh, to this event and, and looking forward to continuing discussing these crucial issues with you in, um, in the coming months and, and years. Now, uh, very quickly, I just since I started this, I uh, wanted to give also Jürgen, if I can ask you to turn on your, on your uh, camera, what would be your, as now states are preparing for uh, the elaboration of a resolution, adopt a negotiation mandate at UNEA 5.2, what would be your key sort of top line recommendation to them as they start to consider uh, national action plans under, under that in, in those negotiations? 
Well, my main recommendation would, of course, be to, to read our report and to follow the nine recommendations, obviously. Um, <clears throat> however, I don't think that is feasible. Um, I think after the Paris Agreement and a lot of the discourse around this new global agreement is focused on a Paris Agreement style type of treaty with very vague form, very vague um, national reporting requirements and um, having a lot of national autonomy and how to formulate your plans. And I think that is the way we're going, unfortunately, in, in my opinion. Um, but there's also a lot of um, focus on single-use plastic. And if you could have a Paris-style agreement with some kind of um, top-down requirements for single-use plastic, that would be a good place to start, I think. But I still believe it's very important to keep in mind what is happening at the national level, what the states are actually doing, and what all of the states are doing, not just the EU or the US or China, but look at the, yeah, as, as we've done in the, the entire world, basically. Brilliant. Thanks very much. A very clear recommendation there to, uh, to, to that. I'm sure that many will find, find useful. Um, Heidi, a uh, quick reflection from you at the end of this webinar, uh, and maybe I can also just add on a tiny, tiny question that I saw now notice in the Q&A box. Uh, to what extent cities, uh, and I guess then the city, the city municipalities and uh, uh, city councils, etc., what their role uh, could and currently is uh, in, in developing um, in national action plans more concretely on, on the city's level. We know that there's been action on city level on other on other issues for for many uh, for many years. So um, maybe you could reflect a little bit on that. That would be useful. Yes, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, with cities, then many councils are part of the development of uh, different uh, action plans. I then recognizing that cities are in a way hotspots both for leakage and and consumption, so that uh, the the approaches that then can be taken at city level varies between municipalities, depending on, on what type of uh, governance approach they have. But especially in terms of putting in place measures to prevent leakage, but also guide policy development at national level. So cities are, are core and should be part of any development of the action plan. I was thinking also around what some other considerations are. I think the working more on the cost of action and non-action are ways of kind of promoting why there should be investments uh, at national level potentially within the implementation of action plans, but also engaging donors and actors that are bringing different types of resources into uh, national action plan development. I think this is an opportunity to map out and also include as part of a national action plan a strategy or considerations for what are the what would be estimated costs. So potentially moving towards costing of action plans, I think could be quite interesting in engaging with donors that may have an interest in specific topics. And then last but not least is the whole digitalization of access to information. We are in a digital setting. We can connect much easier with different stakeholders. And we hope to facilitate that through the digital platform that we're developing. Also facilitating access to data and information to, to make it, um, easier to learn from each other also what the developments and approaches have been for different action plans. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Very, very useful um, final words there. Last, um, very quickly to you, Karen, um, you outlined in your pre presentation this choice in a sense of whether national action plan could be sort of high level strategic or, or more concrete and pres prescriptive. So I just wanted to ask you if you have a sort of overall a preference for, for how these action plans should be sort of the, the high level form or the more concrete and, and prescriptive and action oriented form uh, if you have a preference there or whether it indeed depends on national circumstances. So over to you and, and a few uh, very quickly uh, final words. Yes, um, thank you. I, th I think there's opportunity to perhaps put some prescriptive um, measures in the action plan, but there may be others that should be um, written up as a more high level type of measure within perhaps some other action plans that are more specific to say for instance single use plastic packaging um, so there may be other detailed um, instruments that could flow from that um, that might, might not be possible to elaborate entirely in one document so but I think action plans are key all around thank you all right brilliant thanks very much so um, we are going to end this webinar uh, now. I would like to thank Grid Andal and Norwegian Ministry of 
climate and the environment, especially Ingeborg for, for organizing today's session. Um, a big thanks also to, to our excellent speakers uh, who've shared their, their thoughts. I think you've all definitely made us uh, wiser and better prepared as we go into UNEA 5.2 and of course beyond. Thanks also at the team, to the team specifically at Grid Arndal for their, for their behind the scenes uh, assistance. And, and finally, thanks to all of you in the audience for your, for your engagement and excellent uh, questions. As noted at the uh, outset of this meeting, this is part, this today's um, event was part, of, is part of a webinar series, which will be running until the 15th of February. The next webinar will take place on the 17th of January and be about the role of the UN in efforts to combat marine plastic pollution. So as you all uh, know, uh, by now, you can find more information about this series, this event, this event that we just had on marinelitterhub.com. So with that, uh, I just say uh, thank you all again and goodbye.